Good evening. Welcome to the Shadow Trader Video Weekly for Sunday, April 14th, 2013. Let me actually switch this chart over. I wanted to start on S&Ps as usual. Um, I've left the channels drawn in. We'll get to the Dow and the uh, NASDAQ and everything. Um, market continues to rally. So you can see here I've left my channel drawn in now on the S&P, which is close to 1600. If you recall, when we started this channel analysis, we were saying that the resistance was you know, up here in the 1540 area. That caused a little bit of a pullback, but we never made it even to the 50 MA or to the low end of the channel. So at some point, I'm still expecting some sort of corrective move that is at the very least going to come back to the middle part of the channel. So watch that for a possible target. Um, I'm going to strike a trend line right here, put it right in the middle. Um, or we at least you know come down to touch the 50. So now be aware that as the market continues to rally, 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 the resistance point here on the channel is uh, 1608. Uh, during the course of this past week, we did set a new all-time record in the S&P. I don't really think that means too much. I mean, you have to really keep things in perspective when you look at these charts, especially on the monthly, and see you know just how far we've come and been overextended. You can see here there's a long period. <coughs> excuse me, from March 09 where there was very little correction, right? And we came back and then we had correction. But here, when since we've started moving up from October, uh, really the only corrective action on the monthly was this one month here, which is May, all right? And that's the typical, I guess, you know, the old sell in May and go away, I guess. So we'll see if that proves correct. March and April are, are generally bullish months in the market. Obviously, we're getting that now here. March was very strong and April took us to new highs. So remember, just always keep things in perspective in the longer term charts and see where we are. And that's why I look at these, these trend channels all the time. Now in the Dow, things get really kind of interesting here because you gotta kind of pay attention here. It looks like a bunch of spaghetti, but it's really not. I'll get rid of this horizontal one, make things easier. All this is is just two channels. And you can see here, this, is the main, this was the main dominant channel here these lows. And then because things got steeper and kind of broke here, we broke out of that channel, pulled back to the back side of it and found support and kept going higher. I've now had to draw a second one, which is steeper, which is this one. So that'll give you an idea also as well. Now, I don't think that the Dow can make it to the top end of the channel, to be honest with you. Once, the, once you break out of the dominant channel, which is the lower one, and you start trading on the outside of it, what I sometimes call the backside, it's just a signal that the market is just super duper overextended and it's you know there's basically a lot of risk at being long at those levels um, NASDAQ composite is uh, not as bullish as the rest but we know that but, but did have a bottoming tail hammer on Friday so we'll see if that has consolidation in this area and or uh, pushes higher and as usual the Russell which I think is really kind of a tell it continues to lag and is nowhere close to making highs and remember the whole point of this is that these small cap stocks are more domestic issues and they do not have access to global markets. They're not global players such as some of the larger big caps that are in the Dow. And that's why the Dow is so much stronger. So what that really tells you is it's kind of like a bet against what's going on domestically that I would have to say that under the hood, I'm not a fundamental anal analyst, but this is essentially how rallies end, that there's not as much confidence in the small caps and you have the whole world piling into the big caps, into the Dow stocks because they're quote unquote safe and they pay dividends and they do have more of a, you know, a multinational exposure to them, whereas these smaller companies are really uh, just domestic. So that's the case there. All right, so let's get into the profile and talk about also Friday's pullback, which was really not impressive at all. So if anybody thinks that, you know, just because there was five days in the market straight up that this was the beginning of a down move, I think not. I think that Friday's action was just a minor liquidation break. Certainly if you look at the way the market acted intraday, if it was more than a liquidation break, which is here, and remember a liquidation break is nothing more than just weak hands, which is the shorter term money, getting out of the market, they don't have the gumption to hold for longer periods and then the market gets bought back up. If it was more than a liquidation break, you'd see deeper selling here. When I show you the profile, I'll show you some other nuances as well. And you certainly wouldn't see a market that would rally uh, to close, you know, right back at, it, at its highs here. You know, interest, remember the open high, low close is the most important information, especially the open and the close. And notice that where the market closed on the S&P, or rather opened and closed here on Friday, you actually closed well above the open. So you could argue that um, whenever you close above an open, and if you look on the spy, you can see it's actually a minor green candle, the bulls actually won the day. You can kind of look at it as like, you know, winners and losers who 
who won won or lost the day. So that's that's the way I kind of look at it. So <coughs> excuse me, I don't believe that there's been any real selling in this market just yet and certainly the profile will show us that. So let's take a look at that. Um, here's our market profile on the ES. Here's the rally high on Friday. You see you have a gap gap um, from the close on Friday and here's what's interesting is notice that where we sold off to, right? I want everybody to notice this. This is Thursday's value area and notice that it's right to the penny and it's also very close to these single prints where these two distributions are separated. I've talked about this ad infinitum on the uh, Tasty Trade Show and it's really an important concept is just understanding that if the day time frame is in control this is the type of responsive trade that you will see meaning that pivots and turning points in the market profile will be very visual and very obvious and traders will use them whereas when the other time frame comes into play the longer term money they don't even know that this exists they don't care when they want out they just want out and they're selling and there's a lot of different selling and I thought of a very interesting analogy to this uh, last night actually I wanted to share it with you when thinking about this other time frame we very often always assume that it is institutional money, which it really is. I mean, that's really what drives larger moves is when the, the longer term time frame, the bigger players get in and they either want to be buying, buying, buying or selling, selling, selling. And I believe that the profile over the last weeks, if not months, has shown us that this time frame has completely not been present. I don't think it's been present in the institutional level and I don't think it's been present even on the longer term retail level. I think there's a lot of people just on the sidelines that are not getting involved in this rally. And that's why confidence is essentially low. Even though the market chugs higher every single day, it just click, 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 that doesn't mean that the market has good confidence because the way that the market is going up, 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 it sort of moves up in little fits and starts and backs and fills. And then when it sells off, there's no confidence on the downside because the breaks are just of the liquidation break type nature where they get go down, there's no acceptance lower, just kind of a, a, a spiky move down and then they get bought back up. But the point I wanted to make is that if you're having trouble thinking about this other time frame and, un and understanding who these, these people are and how they act, think about people that you know that are family members or friends who don't watch the markets as ardently as you do, who are not day trading futures, who are not day trading stocks, who are not getting into options positions every day, who are not watching Tasty Trade, listening to Shadow Trader, right? Think about that. Think about your mom, your grandfather, whatever. People that hold stock forever. And they never even look at a chart. They don't know what a chart looks like. They never look at a quote. They just know that it, on some specific day, because of sentiment or whatever, they want to buy stocks. And then on some specific day, be, for whatever reason, they want to sell stocks. But they never even look at a chart or anything, right? They just they just pick up the phone and call their broker and say, sell this, you know, sell sell a portion, sell that, a portion of that, or all of it, or whatever, right? So think about them. They're the other time frame. And when they are in effect, when they when they want in or want out, remember. All of this, a lot of this stuff goes out the window. It doesn't matter. They're not, they're not interested as like, you know, but here you can see that because this daytime frame of these shorter term players is in effect, all of the visual references on the profile are working perfectly, constantly. You sell off, you sell off right to value area low and bounce. It's like right to the penny. It's just working really well, right? You have a value building, you know, in the same areas, essentially, you know, you rally up here and you fail. Where do you fail? Just underneath the value area low, right? And you can go back and just look at all these things over the course of, of all of these days going back and see that, that there's just so much proof here that this other time frame are, is, is non-existent. There's been constant poor structure in the profile, for instance, on this day, April 8th, which was a big expansion to the upside. Notice that the market shot up here and look, who traded up here? Here's the close. Here's where all the value is. Nobody traded up here. Very little. So price and value. So price, in this case, is leading value. And that tells you that the market is just kind of getting ahead of itself. Value needs to move up with price. So it's, it, it's just there's all sorts of examples here of this, of this type of, of poor structure. Here as well. Point of control down here. The bulk of the value here. But they closed it higher. You know? And on and on and on. The next day, 4.9. Same thing. Where's the point of control? The fairest price to do business is here, 1558.50, and we still haven't tested that area. It's now a virgin point of control. And yet, where did we close? Up here. And we went as high as here. And then we gap up and we open here again. And what do we do? Panic buying. Oh, geez, I got to get in this. It's getting away from me. Zip, 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 up. Right? And you have this sort of poor structure of like this letter P where 
It's just like a straight up like a lollipop like that, all right? So there's all sorts of things going on here in the profile under the hood that are clearly telling us that, you know, the risk of, of, of being long is growing all the time, and yet it doesn't matter. There's just something going on sentiment-wise. Maybe it's, it's just cyclical because of the time period. You know, it's, it's April. Get in there before May. I don't know. But all these things have to be kept in mind and constantly, you know, carried forward and just remember them and remember where, for instance, all these virgin points of control are below. You can read my blog every morning where I talk about that, uh, shadowtrader.net uh, under the blog tab. I, I write a, a free article every morning on all this stuff. And if any of this is of interest to you, if you've been following our stuff on Tasty Trade or, or the blog or whatever, you want to learn more, I highly recommend checking out James Dalton's stuff. I've been sending a lot of people over to uh, his seminar that he's going to be doing at the end of April in um, – in Chicago, and we've gotten a lot of response on that, which has been cool. And uh, remember, if you ever want to do anything with Jim, just tell him Peter from Shadow Chair sent you, and uh, he'll take good care of you. All right. So, all right, that's all on the profile. Let's get into some individual stocks and some other ideas I want to talk about. Uh, first thing I want to mention is gold. Gold just got absolutely hammered. I am short a little bit of gold. A couple of GC contracts that I had from a day trade that I actually did live on the Tasty Trade Show. Um, which I believe was here. I think it was late there. Yeah, because it was between two and three o'clock. So what, what I did is I was playing this one on the t on the uh, Tasty Trade Show this short, and it worked out well. I covered the majority of it into weakness down here, and I just left a couple contracts on. You can check my Twitter feed. I have a uh, a bunch of tweets all about this. And the reason I did that is simply for the fact that I was definitely late to the party. I mean, the big short in gold was much earlier in the day, and especially here on the daily you don't see you see a gap here on the GLD because it's not the futures but the futures trading 24 hours actually came right down to the prior support and then bounced and then rolled over and early in the day if, if you had caught it which I didn't uh, like I was saying I was in much later uh, there was just a monstrous moving gold here and that was the reason why I actually covered a bunch of my short here on this move because as I said in my tweets um, I was late to the party this is the second big move of the day and the party had already started much, much earlier. But in the bigger picture, um, I do think gold is going lower. I mean, uh, moving down this much on this much of an increase in volume, uh, there will definitely be lower prices on Monday, I would imagine, a Sunday night when it opens. And if you look on the weekly and the monthly, this could be the start of a much larger slide, right? Notice how high we're still overextended from the dominant trend channel. So gold could actually fall all the way into here, which is about 1,100 an ounce, and still be in this you know monster bull market uptrend that's actually you know been intact for for so long. So it's something to watch for. Silver is also very interesting here because notice that on the monthly uh, it didn't sell off as hard and is now just coming to the support uh, and is actually much closer here to what I see as the trend support. So this actually could be very interesting because I do think silver is a short in the near term. Obviously on the daily it's the same thing as gold. It just hasn't come as far below the, the area here on, on the ETF. Uh, and I, uh, unfortunately I don't have the, uh, the SI contract in front of me so um, I can't compare against that. But it could be an interesting long setup in silver as we come to, to, the, to the trend line here because it's actually relatively close. And again just for a trade. Uh, you know, not meaning that it has to rally all the way back to the $50 highs or anything, but it could be something to look at. All right, let's take a look at a couple more. Um, if you look at the Ask the Shadow column in this week's uh, weekend update, which is where you're looking at this video, just click on the um, table of contents on the left and click on Ask the Shadow. You see that our friend Justin Pulitzer from New York City, he sent us a cool email about Apple. He emails a lot. Uh, I have a lot of correspondence with him. He's a pretty astute guy. And he's always talking about, uh, you know, different option plays in Apple and whatnot. And you can read what he said and what I wrote to him. And he said, you know, is it possible that we have another washout in Apple lower? And I was saying, I think it's definitely possible. And you'll see in the article there that there's this chart, which is a little bit smaller, unfortunately. It's kind of blown up here. But, that, you know, there's there's basically been two channels in play here in Apple, which now, because we've gotten so steep, we've, we've you know, there was this, this first one here. And... This actually has to get re. This actually was down in here, right? I think I had it like this originally, and now I've actually drawn the second one because the rate of decline has kind of shifted. It's kind of gone slower. So I don't know if we actually plunge deeper into this area, but my thought process is is that we could at least go to the. Um, and I'll delete these. We could at least go to the bottom of this trend channel, which would be about four. 105, you don't really see it right here, right in this area, about the 405. Um, certainly there's been a lot of relative weakness here. I mean, just con compare this to the S&P, 
you know, so it's definitely kind of feeling like dead money at this point. But I'm always looking for a trade in this stock because I feel that it respects these lines very well. It's, it's very similar uh, to gold. Some people think that gold is the ultimate charting market in that it respects technical analysis very well. I find in my experience from uh, working with this stock on multiple time frames, day and swing and option, <coughs> excuse me, that it also does the same, that it's it's extremely uh, amenable to technical analysis, and it, it just shows up well. So the trend lines work. I love to strike trend lines in the stock on 60-minute charts and then day trade off of that, wait for those touches of those trend lines. And so, you know, stock's definitely been relatively weak, and I think if it breaks here, if we see the move down here, I would be a buyer. Uh, you can read about what I wrote in the article there, as I was saying, that um, I felt that there could be um, a possibility of a risk reversal trade, and you can check that out um, there meaning that you would be probably selling puts deep out of the money and then using those proceeds to uh, to buy some calls, right? Uh, beyond that, I also want to mention here in the educational articles, um, there is high dividend stock list here, which takes me to my next uh, item up for business. In here, um, I gave a list a while ago, and one of the names that's been performing really well is actually the really speculative one which is down here I'll click to enlarge notice that I had the speculative column down here and I put the WHX which is the Whiting USA Trust because it was a 39 uh, percent uh, yield and Whiting is actually performing pretty well and I wanted to point out the chart pattern to you guys notice that um, after a big pullback here to 550 it's slowly crawling back to the highs here at 784 and if you put it on a bigger chart look what's happening on the weekly so I don't know if a break here is going to send it higher, but look, it's one touch here, then back off. One touch here, back off to a higher low. And now you're crawling back up here. So I think up in this area, if we see some consolidation, that would obviously be the best move of all. If we saw like kind of a shelf there, we could see, we could see the stock uh, pop a little bit more. All right, uh, two things that are also on my radar for this week are price line, which is rallying really hard. And if you look at the weekly, um, I think the stock wants to retest this area here so I'm looking actually already at a 755 765 um, ratio spread and what's it put it right up here seven what's this high here this high is actually 775 so it could be about any any ratio spreads I think in this area would probably make sense the stock probably moves up here and backs off they're not going to report for a while so there's not an earnings risk um, so be aware of that. You could probably get it 10 points wide, which would be interesting. And then Amazon, I think, is in rally mode here ahead of their earnings. Um, notice that when they, they're making this downward channel here, they're going to report on the... Uh, no, I apologize. I don't have it on my blotter. That was Apple. Apple's on the 23rd. I thought I had it on the blotter. I apologize. Um, but anyway, earnings are obviously coming. Um, notice that the down channel here is really orderly, and yet you'd pull back here. You didn't make it to the low end of the channel. You rallied back. So I'm thinking... On the longer term chart, the stock wants a little more higher, and it would make sense basically ahead of their number because this is obviously a very loved stock, and as we know, they've been spending a lot of money on infrastructure, so people are expecting that little by little this is going to finally you know, have an effect on their bottom line, and uh, earnings are going to come in much better, and the stock should pop. So you're going to be watching uh, Amazon uh, up over that line in the uh, uh, coming uh, week, all right? All right, this has been a very long video, a little bit longer than usual, but I uh, hope you've uh, enjoyed it. Sorry if I rambled on too long. Remember, you can always reach me at asktheshadow at shadowtrader.net if you have any questions or comments on anything that I talk about here. Also, check out me and Brad Agunis every day on tastytrade.com or on your Thinkorswim platform under uh, Trader TV. We do a show there uh, every day, 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern, so I hope you can join us for that. It's called Shadow Trader Uncovered. And beyond that, on behalf of myself and the entire Shadow Trader team here in beautiful Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, I wish you good trading and good night.